You're listening to the Geekscape Network. Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. No, I'm Matt. And we're a VHS podcast that looks at the box art, trailers, and behind the scenes. And we are continuing from a franchise last year, the Amityville franchise. Matt, where are we continuing from? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Amityville April. Um, We're picking up in 1992, and it's about time we cover Amityville 6. 1992, it's about time. (laughs) A tradition of terror continues. What are you doing to me? It began the night your father returned from where? Back east. I think it's called Amityville. Amityville. The new chapter begins. Amityville 1992. This is what our house has been missing. It's ugly as hell. I like it. With every second, it grows stronger. Are you down here? With every minute, it gets deadlier. With each passing hour, the danger draws nearer. This clock does more than measure time. It contorts it, distorts it and tears it to shreds. This is the real thing. Moment by moment, (laughs) seduction becomes obsession. We're gonna play a little game. And obsession becomes madness. Hold still. Soon it takes on a life of its own. Beyond place. Beyond time. Beyond evil. You've got a lot of titles to choose from. Yeah, a.k.a. Amityville 1990, it's about time. A.k.a. Amityville, it's about time. A.k.a. Amityville 1992, it's about time. A.k.a. Amityville 6, whatever. (laughs) All right, so we'll catch you up on what we've done. We've done the Amityville from the 70s. We've done number two, The Possession. We've done number three, The 3D Entry in 1983, because all 3D movies apparently came out in 1983. Uh, We did number four which was The Evil Escapes, might be the worst in the franchise so far, but it did get a really good episode. We got a great episode out of it with the Jersey Ghouls. And then we have The Fifth, which was really boring, The Curse, but, you know, we had some things, you know, about the VHS cover. Now we're getting into the thick of the 90s with 1992's Amityville, It's About Time. Finally, we're in the 90s with these Amityville movies because outside of the first one, these are the ones that as a kid I remember really liking. So I'm excited to go in this back half here and swim in these like Vidmark Republic pictures, ones that came out. And we get into the like killer objects portion of this. We started with the Evil Scapes, which was an evil lamp. But then the fifth one kind of went away from that. And then the sixth one, we come back, and this one's pretending like we have the original trilogy, one, two, three, and then this is a sequel from three. Which, thank God, because four and five are so awful. They're so bad. (laughs) Let's start fresh. I mean, two and three are no, like, masterpieces by any stretch of the imagination. I think three is a lot better than two, but that's still, like... Not a high bar to clear, Uh, but four and five were so bad of movies. You know, I honestly feel like we can only go up from here. I uh, my worst one was five. I had a really hard time with five because it was so boring. At least four, Mm -hmm. you could make fun of. Yeah, we're back to the cursed object portion, and this is a another even credited so as another adaptation of the Evil Escapes book that was Mm -hmm. written. Yeah, I think this was another short story by the same author. Mm -hmm. And so this is the last one based on any sort of literature. The next couple still keep the cursed object form formula, but uh, no more are we following that story, that Mm -hmm. evil escape story. The main character 
Jacob. I don't even remember the dad's name. It's play, played by Stephen Mott. Uh, yeah, it is Jacob. Is flying back from New York. We assume this is somewhere out west. I would say California, somewhere like that, Nevada. I don't know. I think they say California. I don't remember where in California, but I think they say it. So, yeah, but he comes out west from, he takes a trip to the East Coast and mm-hmm. brings his family back something that he found, which happens to be a haunted clock this time. Getting into this VHS, the clock in the background, okay, that makes sense. But then it's got the original Amityville house, but that house is never really in this film. It's drawn by the dad, who is an architect, but... It's not actually anywhere in this movie. Yeah, we don't go to New York at all. He is coming back from New York, but we don't see that portion of the journey. So we are just in California with this clock that we know came from the house. But yeah, we never spend any time in New York in this one, which by part six in the series, I'm totally fine with. (laughs) Yeah, I don't mind that we're leaving the house. And I, I kind of get, you know, entities and objects. I think it's silly, but I get it. So whatever, I'll roll with it. But we have the top of this VHS from the director of Hellbound Hellraiser 2. We have a tagline here of the terror returns with a vengeance. The title Amityville 1992 and it's about time. What a silly title. I just like, I'm I'm glad they did it. Like, I think it's, I think it's funny and like cheeky, but like for this series, hmm, not sure. Because the movies prior haven't really been fun uh and now we're having some fun here what a silly silly title but it's it's 1992 baby the world's different <laughs> yeah it's changed everyone's divorced and we're seeing therapists and environmentalists and i don't know i really don't get why they put 1992 on this i assume it was to distance itself from the original one to let you know it's a new one in the 90s and it's about time you're like hey finally we get another sequel maybe something like that yeah it's about time one of these is good (laughs) (laughs) Ooh. (laughs) uh yeah so how about you uh read the back of this something this evil never dies it just finds new people to terrorize new lives to destroy and new ways to fulfill its destiny The legendary horror of Amityville continues in California, unleashing a violent reign of terror on an unsuspecting suburban neighborhood in Amityville 1992. It's about time. Jacob Sterling returns from a business meeting in New York with a surprise for his family, a vintage clock from an antique store in Amityville. No sooner is it on the mantle before dark supernatural forces begin to take control of their lives. Animals and objects take on minds of their own. Innocent young girls turn into sadistic killers. Friends and family turn on each other as the force brings them closer to total surrender. No one can resist its temptations. No one can overcome its power. And no one is safe from the terror. Good job reading that because it's white text on kind of a cloudy background. Yeah, it's over like a screaming dude. Uh, (laughs) We get like, of course, like kind of the best uh screenshots of the screen grabs of this movie here with the melted face guy and the guy coming out of the bathtub which are kind of the more uh memorable moments sort of from the end of this movie which i was convinced when i saw that the melting guy i was like is this another screaming mad george thing but this can be so <laughs> props to can be for doing some good slime well it looks inspired by his stuff Yeah, it's nice. Uh, When we get to the end of this, this definitely has some good practical effects, some good makeup. Good job on that. Uh, I wish it would have picked up a little bit sooner, but at least the ending was fun. Finally, again, it's about time we finally get some kind of like effects, monsters, stuff like that in in this one, uh, which we just, the last one just had, uh, what's his name? Kim Coates (laughs) killing people. (laughs) Everything was just so slow, so mundane, so boring. Nothing to do with the house, maybe in the same neighborhood. Even that is kind of a guess that we came up with. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So this already looks more exciting. So let's pop this tape in. And now, our feature presentation. We get no trailers. It goes straight into the movie. All right. So we get a dad returning from New York. You know, he's got a special object for the whole family. It's a cuckoo clock. What kids don't want a cuckoo clock? Now, I will be honest, as an adult, I kind of was like, oh, that's pretty cool. (laughs) But as a kid, I probably would have had the same reactions as these kids. Like, okay, thanks, dad. Whatever. 
I gotta give this movie props early on, too, because, like, the dad comes home, and the mom is acting so weird, and then they fucking pay it off at the end, and I was like, okay, okay, Amityville, I see you. <laughs> yeah, that was, like, where he asked what she was doing with the T-square that she had, and she's like, uh, protection? And the dad's kind of like, um, okay. And then we find out that's not even the mom. Oh, that's that's true. That's right. I it, She is the former lover of the dad in the movie, Whose wife died? Question mark. Right? Yeah, we don't know when she dies. Okay, she died. She died, and this was the uh, other woman he was seeing. But she now is just kind of almost like a caretaker. She helps with the kids, but she is not part of the family and doesn't really have a relationship with the dad. But they hook up when they get together sometimes. Yeah, it's it's an odd one. It's an up and down relationship. I was questioning it the whole time. But I think at the end, it kind of makes sense because I think they're on a loop. Yes. Yeah, so the movie, I mean, spoilers, but you know, you listen to this podcast. We tell you everything. Uh, but spoilers, the movie is a loop. Uh, the end of the movie is also the beginning. And that is why she's holding the T-square and looks so stressed out is that she just lived through the whole journey of the uh, of the movie. And it's really a, a kind of a journey of her letting go of this guy. And it's about time she leaves. Um, and she even says that. So that's kind of what the movie is about. It's about sort of things running their course and mm. needing to walk away, which is kind of funny that like the sixth movie in this series is talking about running its course. Um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, and I, it, it's a clever way to tie in this uh, time loop thing. This movie didn't necessarily need to do because it's kind of a direct to video thing, but it was it kind of makes it a little clever and fun. That we are go- uns- unsuspectingly going on this time loop journey. I think it would be funny to put an edit up of this film where it's just the ending. And you're like, okay, that's it. It's a five minute film. <laughs> <laughs> this is the time that she just decides to smash the clock. You could probably easily put that up and people would be like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> it's about to get her saying it's about time. Walk it away and credits. <laughs> it's the best Amneville since Amneville won. Except the internet, who uh, all the horror fans I know love the second one so much. Then they probably listen to us and just like, wow, you guys didn't like that at all. Like, are you kidding me? It was disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I, I truly, I mean, as we are getting into it here, I truly think this is the best since the first one. Um, which, again, not a high bar to clear, but still, welcome. I'm I'm happy it's about time one of these is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, when my brother talked to me about the first one, he's like, wow, I'm surprised you guys like that it that much because it's really boring. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, everyone is telling me that I missed out on how boring it was. I just, I thought it was better than the second one. But everyone disagrees with me. I stand by it. I like the first one. I think the first one's a cool little haunted house movie. I, I really enjoy the movie. So yeah, it's sort of the backlash we've heard of people thinking, that the whole series sucks. I disagree with. I think there's some bright spots in the first one. I, I really like, and then, again, I think this is probably the best sequel we've seen so far. It only took six movies, but uh, we finally get a good one. That's not to say though that this movie's perfect, because something we mentioned before we started rolling, and I agree with you about the first half hour of this movie is pretty slow. Yeah, we get this whole like weird family dynamic, you know, where the mom's passed away. Rusty is the typical 90s kid. You know, he's got a Skull Crusher t-shirt on. He's yep. got a, This kid was me in the 90s. <laughs> he's got his earring on one side. And, you know, we got the innocent girl. She actually seems like she hasn't been affected by losing her mom that much. But she's also had this, you know, other motherly figure kind of around we don't i mean she lived in the house for a number of years so they were obviously really close you know like she's like telling her about boys that she's meeting in high school and you know i think he's got an eye on a senior and we we get all this you know family drama shit and then the, the clock slowly starts to make especially the dad just drives the dad insane yeah the two people the clock kind of takes is the dad and the daughter the Son has a friend who is an old lady who yes. knows all about evil and spirits and stuff like that. And they, without even explaining anything, it's just like, oh, they're friends. They hang out. They play chess together. And I love that the movie doesn't even, you know, worry 
about telling us. <laughs> no, did she used to babysit him or something when the yeah. mom died? None of that. They're like, no, isn't it weird that this rebel is friends with this old lady and she knows everything about the house from the New York? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Put it together. Wonderful. I don't need any explaining. <laughs> it's perfectly just like there for me to accept. So he's okay because he has this connection. And then obviously our lead in the movie is this caretaker girlfriend surrogate mother character and she is not taken by it also have to mention that the daughter is once again one of my big 90s crushes of all time if not my biggest megan ward had a megan ward double feature with the last movie we watched (laughs) and that was not planned at all i didn't even know she was in this movie (laughs) I did not. I forgot she was in this one. Uh, and I was so excited because I watched this one first before I watched Freaked because I hadn't seen this one ever before. So I was like, oh, Megan Ward again. And she's a little younger in this. Almost looks younger than how maybe she would in 92, which makes me think this was shot earlier. But there's no information about that. So I don't know. Except for a poster that says Amityville 1990. It's about time. So maybe this was delayed. I don't know. We just don't know. I mean, that easily the 1990 just could have been, you know, a poster to try to get money together to make exactly. the movie. So who could knows? have just been, yeah, like a trade poster or whatever. Not even necessarily, you know, anything to really do with the movie. So who knows? But great to see Megan in this. And I'm very excited. <laughs> well, when I first saw this, I was like, Jesus, what is she like 16? And at the end of the film, all the stuff she starts to do when the evil takes kind of takes over her body. I was like, oh, God, I hope she's at least like 22. <laughs> like, ugh. Uh, but yeah, when I looked up her age, I was like, oh, okay. So I think at this time she was about 20, 21, 22. They just do a, such a good job of making her look like a 16 year old in the beginning that it is weird to see the transition. But then again, I guess you could say good job with the transition because it, it worked on me. I, I was like, oh, wow, this is like the youngest I've seen her. And then at the end, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> this is this is the Megan Ward I'm used to. She has a similar thing crossover from two, though, where it kind of dip, tiptoes into incesty. Yep. Like she's kind of hitting on the brother. Not gross here, though. Something about the woman being in control makes it a little less gross than when it's the older brother doing it to the younger sister and two in that movie. It feels nasty in this movie. It just feels like an exploitation horror movie fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. And she actually doesn't have sex with anyone. She's just kind of like, you know, it's like the devil entering the woman using her sexuality to get what she wants, even though she doesn't really want anything. She just kills a dude melts a dude yeah (laughs) melts the boyfriend and then is like hitting on her brother uh to try to kill him i always call this like the basically the football player from the 88 blob oh yeah for sure it's like the same character except well i guess an 88 blob you know he he appears to be the nice guy and then they kill him like just freaking you out like oh my god the main character's gone and this one when he finally gets killed and everything it's like some of his scenes were cut Cause they only had one scene previous and then you get this kid coming into the house and you know, he's like, Oh man, stop teasing me. Uh, you, you know what I want? And then she melts him. But I feel like there was a couple <laughs> scenes that were just like cut out. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, they talk about him, even though we only see the one other scene with him, we do hear about him. She's, she has two different occasions where she's telling the, the main character about her, you know, crush and or relationship at school. And we know he's got a cute butt. <laughs> oh, that's what she yeah. says about him. <laughs> Man, the scene where the dad goes jogging and then peaches the dog just rips him up wow because later on that wound the couple wounds that he gets are gnarly and gross looking he's totally worn down by this clock and him being sort of possessed by the evil of amityville or whatever his sores just become these pussing throbbing he, again very screaming mad georgie kind of like gnarly horror wounds they don't look like real wounds they look like monster wounds um because he's possessed by the evil of amityville (laughs) oh i know and those dressings that he comes back from the hospital with are awful they're like bleeding through and there's like green pus coming out and i'm like no hospital would let you leave like this (laughs) 
<laughs> you might have gangrene in there, brother. <laughs> and the doctor's like, nah, he'll be fine. He'll be on his le- he'll be on his feet in a couple days. And I'm like, change the bandages. He'll be all right. <laughs> in what world are you in, doctor? They really <laughs> did not give a shit about this part of the story. They're like, yeah, just come on. We got to go. We got to get to Dick Miller. We do get a Dick Miller cameo putting out a neighborhood fire, you know, caused by the clock. <laughs> Which makes me want to talk about the director, Tony Randall, who is just what a wacky career starts off with, you know, the. Um, oh, Roger Corman. Yeah, he's one of the New World execs. Yeah, well, he was he started off as someone who came in and was doing some of the effects stuff. And then he became an executive in the entire entire company. Then he's directing, you know, Hellraiser 2. We've got It's About Time. And then he's going into doing Ticks, which is an underrated monster flick that you need to see. We'll talk about it at some point because that VHS is awesome. We'll talk about that one at some point. We have to. <laughs> but then he gets into softcore porn for a while. He's also an editor. He's a writer. Just does everything. He's even into ham radios if anyone's interested. Interesting guy, and I think the presence of Dick Miller here is just his sort of nod to where he came from in the Roger Corman sphere with New World. And did you see he directed a movie called Fist of the North Star, which I assume is based off the anime? It is based on. I've seen it on the Sci-Fi Channel before. He did another one, too. What's the other fantasy epic he did in the 90s? He did the visual effects for Escape from New York, which I always forget about that. I have seen that credit before with him. I think I was just thinking yeah. of Fist of the North Star, not not any of the other ones. Well, don't forget, he did two episodes of Power Rangers in Space. Like I'm saying, this guy's all over the place. <laughs> directed episodes of Beyond Belief, Factor Fiction, the TV series. I remember that with uh, the guy from Star Trek. I, I watched that show. And he is now in the direct-to-video dog uh, <laughs> movie sphere doing a doggone adventure. Yeah, I saw that and I'm like, well, that's one my grandma would have rented me back in the day. <laughs> I am an expert in the subgenre of dog adventure films of the 90s. <laughs> so I love how I started watching this and I go, hey, look, it's the dad from Monster Squad. And then the next thing out of my mouth is, hey, look, it's the girl from Baywatch from the first season. I'm like, how do I know this? Sean Weatherly. <laughs> I always remember every time I've seen her because she's, you know, been working quite a bit in her career. And I'm like, hey, it's the girl they thought was going to be popular in Baywatch. And then she just faded. You know, I think she left to have kind of a film career. And uh, Amityville 1992 didn't exactly set her on fire, even though this movie was a success on video. Yeah, it was. It really was. They did a good job with the marketing, I guess, on this. And this was the perfect time period. To capitalize on direct videos you know, with like the Leprechaun success that came in the 90s. There's a lot of films that just, you could spend just a little bit of money, get it just good enough, and make a lot of money to the direct video market. Absolutely. And, and truly, like, if you grew up on stuff like Leprechaun and the Trimark movies, the Vidmark movies and stuff like that, you would like this movie, I think, because I think it fits in that sphere. You know, like uh, like uh, this movie started and it just felt so, you know, California direct to video shot in like 15 days or whatever it was. Like it has that vibe from the very start. And that's just like it. Wa- it's warm to me. It's like a blanket. <laughs> I love the comforts of early 90s direct to video horror movies. Yeah, it's funny, too. I, I see that she was in a movie called Shadow Zone from 1990, and I was like, oh, I totally remember that at the VHS, you know, at the video store. This is, speaking of Shadow Zone, is a big full moon kind of reunion. Stephen Macht from the Transfers movies, Sean Weatherly's in Shadow Zone, Megan Ward in a ton of them, and uh, Nita Talbot is also in a bunch of full moon movies, or at least one I can think of. Um, so you've got all these familiar faces from these type of movies and especially you know me being like a full moon super fan it was so exciting to see like four people from this time from these kind of movies in this this feels like full moon's entry into the amityville series (laughs) getting more back into this film the best scene in this film i think is that ppk dinner table scene with the therapist where he's just like oh the ppk you know the german soldiers use this in world war ii wonderful manufacturing you know he's just like talking to this therapist and basically pointing the gun at him it's a terrific piece of machinery incredibly accurate never jams 
just a work of art to look at. But I guess its day has passed. I tell you one thing, though. You turn this puppy on some asshole and you can slip your wrist through the hole it'll leave behind. Are you fucking Andrea? My Andrea. Don't lie to me, you bastard fornicator. What are you talking about? I love that entire thing because, one, I hated the therapist. What an annoying character. (laughs) And this is, again, last week we talked about in the 90s with the environmentalist being such a trope of the 90s. So are therapists. And uh, evil or snooty or highfalutin or asshole therapists specifically. (laughs) Where they're just like wordy and they're overthinking everything and then just basically hitting you with a bunch of jargon. That you don't understand. I mean, you un- you know the words, but when he puts them all together, I'm like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah, it's just one of those, you know, highfalutin assholes that's going to analyze everything you say and talk down to you. Yeah, we know this guy. <laughs> we, you know, the 90s movies made me think that this guy was going to be more prevalent in my life. But <laughs> Well, they might be out there, just no one's talking to them. Yeah, I'm definitely not keeping them in my sphere. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, nope. If I met that guy at a bar, I'd be like, no, 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 no. I like your moccasins, but get the hell out of my face. (laughs) Quit talking at me. (laughs) Let me tell you why you're ordering that drink. Get the fuck away from me. I don't care. Not doing this today. (laughs) (laughs) I'd rather go talk to the horror gatekeepers over there (laughs) who keep telling me why I am not a good fan. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, that'd be a tough choice. Over analytical guy or guy that's telling me wrong that my opinions are wrong. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know what? I'm going to go with the analyst. I'm going to go with the psychotherapist. <laughs> Maybe I'll learn something about myself as opposed to feeling bad about my opinions on the Amityville series. <laughs> uh, you don't like number four? That one had the best story. You are not a fan of Amityville. Did you even read the books? Uh, I'm out. I'm out. Bye. <laughs> Oh my god. No one no one's defending four. <laughs> but you know, you know, I could see them criticizing you for not reading the source material. Yeah, I think the criticism that comes from the gatekeepers in terms of Amityville is the pass them off entirely. And I'm like, no way. There's stuff to dig in on these movies. Like <laughs> Or yeah, the gatekeepers love too for some reason, and I think that's very telling oh. of how the gatekeepers are. <laughs> Trust me. They they told me. They told me they like it. Uh I hear you don't like the Amniville series. Um, no, not really. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, but I don't think many people like the series as a whole. But yeah, number two is protected. Very weird. I like the first one. They don't. I don't like the second Whatever. one. They do. Whatever. <laughs> the brother and sister gross stuff in this. You're right. It's not as bad as number two. It's nowhere near as bad as number two. But I, I do love at the end of this. You know, how he he punches his sister in the face. And I think at one point they were trying to make the brother attracted to the sister. But they left that real quick. Because as soon as he gets in that room and she's in her underwear, well, he's like, open the door. And she like opens her, like takes off her bra or whatever. And he goes, I'm not talking about that. And then punches her in the face. Yeah, it, it's true. You told there's like one shot where you can almost like see he's like thinking about it but then yeah when like the moment comes and she's being licking his ear and hitting on him and stuff he's like nope not feel, nope not feeling this at all <laughs> no that's, that's really gross i don't even have a sister and i was i was grossed out by that and i'm like yuck but again it works better in this movie than in two because it doesn't feel as like hateful and gross and it's more horror movie silly in this as opposed to like almost like real in the second one it feels yeah way too gross Yeah, and I do love how they're trying to mirror, you know, the whole axe from the first one with this (laughs) T-square. The ruler. I cracked up on that. I'm like, ah, okay, that was a little too far, guys. Uh, I get what you're doing. Maybe it worked better in the book, but when I watched it on this, it was pretty goofy. Especially once we get to, like, the last 20 minutes. This movie is kind of wonderfully goofy, though. Again, it's slow, slow to start. It doesn't really, like, light up until... Like the last half hour, the middle half hour is fine, Um, but the last half hour is probably the most fun of this movie. And yeah, it's like direct to video, full moony, goofy 90s, melting people stuff, you know, (laughs) fun. It's fun. Yeah, I, I don't understand what they were trying to do with like the house turning into a clock. 
I just was like, well, that's kind of a cool effect where the clock gears and everything are behind the wall. But after the, you know, we find out it's a cycle and she smashes the cycle by destroying the clock when it first comes in the house at the end. And we get the line, it's about time. Ha ha ha. What I was most happy about was the dog didn't die. I'm like, oh, good. The dog's still alive. Peaches. Peaches makes it. And Peaches is not really, I guess, threatened that much in this movie either. It just sort of bites Stephen Mock, maybe. Like an evil version of Peaches bites him. But yeah, yeah the dog makes it out scot-free. That was my, I go, oh, the dog's not dead. That's literally what goes into my head at the end. <laughs> 30 minutes in, I was really worried about this film. But at the end of the day, after watching a 90 minute film like this, I was kind of happy. I was like, you know, this film was really wasn't that bad. Now, a lot of that could be comparing to the last couple ones we had to watch. But at the end of the day, the Amityville starting out in the 90s. This isn't bad. This is a pretty good direct to film, a direct to video horror film. I agree. It has it just has that vibe, that early 90s direct to video vibe where, like you said, you know, they pump a little bit of money into it. The movie's well made. There's some production value there. But, you know, it's a cheap horror movie in the end. Uh, but it, it hits all the checks, all the boxes. It hits all the right things. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I just think that this one in the end ends up being pretty fun. And it, it feels like my bread and butter. You know, this this early 90s direct to video vibe is my thing. So it, it feels it feels like a warm hug. It does. And um, I'm sure there was a lot of teenage boys that love this for the whole Megan Ward scenes. Oh, it's probably for the best that I didn't see this as a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just say that. <laughs> Enough said. I just thought it was funny that they they like dressed her in the most plain uh, underwear possible. I just looked at it and I'm like, who picked this out? Because they were going for like this hot temptress. You know, I thought maybe red underwear. Why didn't they go with plain Jane White? Yeah, and it's not super revealing either. Well, you know, it's it's obviously underwear, but it's not like tiny or anything like that. So she's pretty covered up. So, yeah, I'm not sure what they're going for there. But uh, again, glad I didn't see this as a teenager, though. <laughs> I'm just assuming the person who was in wardrobe was like an old man. He's like, well, this is what my wife wore back in the day. <laughs> It probably absolutely was an old guy. <laughs> and she's like, uh, I've got better stuff at home. No, you're going to wear that. <laughs> I don't know why I always see an old withered man in like doing the sets when they're really bad or doing the wardrobe when something's questionable. So, ah, trust me, I've been doing this since 1942. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's always an old white guy who's always just doing the same thing. Over and over and over again. Uh, I got curlers for your hair if you... Where'd you go? (laughs) (laughs) I worked on Casablanca, damn it. Don't tell me what I'm doing is bad. (laughs) Now put on these white gigantic panties. (laughs) (laughs) Man, I guess we're ready to go in the museum. Let's do it. This is the second time I've had to reclaim my property from you. That belongs in a museum. So do you. This is the part of the show where we go out in the film jungle like Indy and bring something back to our Amityville wing of the museum. And it's expanding. It's getting very big. We've got a stupid clock somewhere. Uh, We've got, I don't know, all kinds of stuff like a giant house. Yeah, yeah. A, a wrong house, which has tunnels underneath it, maybe to the old house. <laughs> yes, like there's there's a lot of shit in this wing. But where are we going to add from It's About Time? I'm going to add the cast uh, overall. Like I mentioned, I was super excited to see Megan Ward in this. But also, yes, yeah, Stephen Mock, Sean Weatherly, Nita Talbot. People I recognize. I recognized Rusty. I don't know from what, but I've recognized him from something too. Dick Miller has a cameo in it. Uh, I like the cast of this one a lot, and I think they're all good in the movie, and I think they bring it up a level from just, like, kind of basic direct-to-video kind of stuff. They're all good in it, and they're all game for what this is, especially Stephen Mock. When he goes crazy and he's got the oozing things on his side, he's great. Completely unhinged, which makes me think that he's the nicest person in real life, that he can play these over-the-top evil characters like this. Oh, and when she stabs him... In the gooey bites and everything. I felt it. 
That was it's gross. Icky. It's icky. Yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh, she doesn't even like stab it into his leg. She like stabs through skin that's like drooping off that's been like slashed at. I, I don't yeah. know. I was like, oh. I, I kind of want to add like the entire neighborhood of characters. They're so weird. You get Dick Miller putting out a hedge fire that mysteriously, you know, just started. And he's like, well, I guess your husband's happy now because uh, the hedges are to code. You never actually saw the dad complain to Dick Miller about that. But they had Dick Miller for one hour, so they used him. But, like, the cops that are complete idiots that seem like they're on their own film where they're just like, oh, another night in paradise. You're like, what? What? <laughs> These cops are so bad at their jobs. And they accuse the kid of, like, painting a swastika. Yeah, across the street. Yeah. <laughs> really, they just gloss over. That just happens real quick. And they're like, well, we know you know who did it because you're part of that group at uh, school. And all those kids dress weird. Right. And they're right. like, wait, what? And I'm like, so did the ho- how did the house paint that swastika? Well, it probably possessed either the dad or the daughter to do it because it had such a hold on them that's my assumption but i don't know i was wondering if we if they like ended up you know they didn't want to go too long on this film so they ended up cutting like the dad going across the street killing the dog and then painting the swastika with the dog's blood or something because he did the whole ppk scene at the dinner table because there was a link to germany in this film in a couple spots with the swastika with the ppk and i even think the older grandma aunt which i'm going to call her call back from number four i think grandma aunt mentioned something about germany too yeah there is this weird unspoken like obviously it's not spoken because they mentioned it but like this uh, underlying nazi thread that only comes up in these bursts but never fully addressed and never fully like spoken of what its connection to Amityville is, but it's some curious little breadcrumbs that, you know, maybe someday we could explore. <laughs> and the clock that came ac- across the Atlantic, I think the clock was supposed to be from Germany. There's these connections to wh- what could be one of the things possessing the house, the original house, through maybe this cursed object. Who knows? I'm wondering if it's in the book. Oh, maybe. That's a good... If I could read. Well, I just look at words and get dizzy, so... Yeah. Well, lately I've been watching too many movies and it's making me dizzy, so <laughs> too many tapes. That's that's something that should never be uttered again out of your mouth. <laughs> no, no such thing. Yeah. No you such watch thing. those things until you're sick. And then when you get better, watch more. Watch more. And that <laughs> Consume. Is, the cycle. <laughs> is the vicious cycle that I've been in my whole life. <laughs> Uh, that'll end it this week for Amityville. It's about time. It's a quick episode, but it was fun. Uh, and then we're going to be back next week. What is the Amityville for next week? We have Amityville, a new generation. It's not Texas Chainsaw Massacre, next generation. That's going to be funny if that's just the movie. Whoops. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what it was about the mid nineties where everything had to be the next generation of something like Star Trek generations. And yeah, uh, Texas Chainsaw Next Generation. Here we are (laughs) with a new generation, Amityville 7. Yeah, I feel because the 90s were doing a bunch of stuff from the 70s, you know, like we had Mm -hmm. the Brady Bunch movie and we had all kinds of TV shows being redone in the late 90s and early 2000s. Yeah, that must be what it is. It's like the new generation coming in the 90s. This movie has it because it has it is that direct to video 90s feel but the next movie i think in a big way is is that we are the amityville for the 90s so excited to talk about that one i haven't seen that one since uh i was a teenager so excited to revisit it i haven't seen any of these so they're all brand new so it's it's kind of fun to just like jump into these i'm sad because now this is the last one that i hadn't seen so now with the remaining four Amityville's. I have seen them all now, but I haven't seen them in a while. So I'm excited to dig in, at least on the next two. Uh, I haven't seen in a while. So I'm excited to dig in on those and see how I feel about them all these uh, years later and comparatively to the other ones because I've never watched the series in order, obviously, because I hadn't seen so many of them. Excited. I, I actually think this will be fun to see all these 90s. Like, because, you know, the 90s, even if they were bad, they were gimmicky. 
and there there's going to be effects. There's going to be goop. There's going to be gore. There's going to be sex. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be all those things that we loved about picking up movies at the video store, I think, uh, with at least these next two. Exactly. All right, that'll end it this week, so remember to be kind. And rewind. Haley Piper, Patrick Lacey, S.E. Howard, Waylon Jordan, and Jeremy Herbert. Five acclaimed authors of horror and dark fiction. Their twisted tales appeared in the acclaimed horror anthology Worst Laid Plans from Grindhouse Press. Now, their tales of vacation terror are coming to the big screen in a feature film adaptation from Genre Blast Films. Five acclaimed genre filmmakers will bring these stories to life. Samantha Koyesnik, John Hale, Vanessa Yonta Wright, Michael Escobedo, and Jeremy Herbert. Worst Laid Plans. Now crowdfunding on Indiegogo. This is one vacation you'll be dying to take. <laughs>